Welcome to the Korea Society's live webcast. I'm Jayo, Senior Director of Arts and Culture. In her latest book, The Power of Nunchi, The Korean Secret to Happiness and Success, Yuni Hong explains the practice of Nunchi in a highly prescriptive guide for social su success. Yun Yong is famously known for her insightful and humorous reporting on Korea, and in this book, she explains how nunchi is a part of daily life in Korea, how a great deal of communication is based not on words, but on the overall context of an interaction. Yun Yi Hong is the author of The Birth of Korean Cool and a journalist who has written for, among many others, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, and the Financial Times. The Power of Nunchi is now available as paperback wherever books are sold. Uni is, join Uni is joining us live to talk about her latest book and more. Welcome back to the Korea Society, Uni. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you. It's been a really long time. The last time I, was, I had gave a talk with you was uh, for my previous book, The Birth of Korean Cool. Yeah. So, and uh, again, it, we have to do it this in this way, but it's great to have you back. A quick reminder to our viewers, you can send your questions via Twitter at Korea Society Art or email artsandculture at koreasociety.org. So let's talk about Nunchi. Um, how about we start with your definition of what nunchi is? And since you use the Korean word nunchi throughout your book, is mm -hmm. this a word that is translatable to English or any other language, or is it just a very Korean concept? Right, so nunchi is uh, two syllables because it's two words. Nun means I, and chi is uh, people ask me if it's related to chi, like, you know, like energy. It's not the same word. It means it's a chi that means measure. So uh, it's literally eye measuring or measuring with your eyes. Uh, and I like to think of it as like literally an optical scan or, um, you know, like when the Terminator walks into a room and is, you know, he has like a augmented reality screen for instead of actual eyes and it tells him where everything is in the room. And that's sort of the mental image I have when I think of the word Gucci. Mm -hmm. um, another way of explaining it, just using a, an everyday English idiom is reading the room. Uh, there's a similar actually uh, idiom in, in French, prendre uh, la temperature de la situation, read the temperature, take the temperature of the situation. Um, I found out while writing this book that pretty much every culture has something like Nunchi but they don't have something exactly like it. Um, and uh, the book was actually, it's been translated now, I, need, I think into um, 20 languages, um, which is, well, it's cool for me, but the point aside from being a flex is that um, you know, at other people feel that it might be something unique and they wanna learn more about it. Um, right, so what, I guess what the, the subtext of, is there another word for it is people, want to know what isn't this sort of common sense isn't this sort of reading the room and I would say that there are a couple of big differences um, so reading the room in the general sense is uh, most people just sort of look at individual people that they know or um, you know certain interactions but without registering it as a whole uh, whereas Nunshi sort of treats the room as if it's a an entity, okay. um, right? So like when you go into a room, like there's a Korean word that I hate to say something's untranslatable, but there's a very Korean concept besides nunchi is a punuigi, right? which means it, re it means the atmosphere, atmosphere of a room, but in a very live, alive way. Like right. not it to sound all woo, but the, the room has a spirit. The room has a personality. And it is um, greater than the sum of the parts, the people in it. So Nunchi is ascertaining not just individual people's thoughts or the people that you know, or your friends or the, the best looking person or the ugliest person, but the room as a whole, even if people aren't talking, will always have a mood. And people kind of know this um, intellectually. Um, and I always like to say that Nunchi is something that's more prominent in its absence. Uh, yes. Right, so like a classic situation would be 
And this happens all the time. Like somebody just barges into a room and everyone looks really tense and upset. And then, you know, the person who barged in make, makes a joke like, where's the funeral? Which is probably not a very good thing to say because, you know, sometimes somebody actually did just die or, you know, it's, they, there was just bad news. Um, so it's something we all know that we need to do. But with, I think the great thing about having the word nunchi is that we, it's a way to sort of stick a pin on it, stick a pin in the concept and be aware of it mm. um, and how it's more than just paying attention. So that's a very long, yeah, go ahead. Mm. So is it sort of a basic instinct or is it like an analytical skill? Because you talk about how some people are just born with it and then some people just develop it so do you think or is it combination of both um i think well to answer that question so in the book i ha- i describe there are three parts of the brain this isn't very scientific but roughly speaking in terms of evolution we know when when each part of the brain evolved so the the in the core there's the reptilian brain it's sometimes called that um and it's the most primitive instinct about survival uh, and how to get food. And it's called the reptilian brain because anything that is reptilian or lower order, or I mean, sorry, reptilian or higher order or even lower order has this brain. Uh, and the second is, I think it's the limbic brain. And that's where we have like, so I think that's where we have feelings um, a little bit more than just where do I get my food and mating. Um, and, uh, above that, this, the highest level is the cerebral cortex, which is logic, decision-making, uh, the part of the brain that you use when you're studying for an exam or, you know, sitting at your computer, um, you know, in modern society, even, even in Korea, it's the, the third part, the cerebral cortex that is privileged, but I would say nunchi is actually only 10%. Cerebral cortex, and I would say the remaining ninety percent are the, the the limbic, emotional, and the reptilian, uh, which is instinctive. Um, and that's another thing that makes nunchi different from just reading the room, because in Korea there's a sense that nunchi is actually really important to survival. Um, it's not just like, you know, make sure that you, cl- you know, eat with your mouth closed. It's not just paying attention to be civilized and polite. It's paying attention because you will sort of get in a lot of trouble and be trod upon and have a lot less than you deserve because you know everyone knows people who are really talented or whatever, and they never quite attain the level of people who are much less talented. And um, often it's because there's something about them that nobody has ever told them is a problem. And that the thing that nobody wanted to tell them that the missing thing is pretty much usually nunchi. So then um, you also talk about how, you know, in Korean, when you, when you assess somebody's nunchi and when you praise that um, yeah. they have good nunchi, you don't say yeah. they have good nunchi, you have quick nunchi, nunchi ka parida. You know, that's yeah. the way you compliment somebody. So this, can you tell us a little bit about this? idea of how to do it, not just well, but to do it really quickly. It's like, it's almost like the sense of it happening instantaneously, right? Right. Well, yeah, because it's not that useful if it happens after the person's no longer there, you know, um, like the concept of, um, you know, like uh, when you have a perfect comeback and you, right after they've already gone down the stairs or something. Um, yeah, there's no point in having slow nunchi. Um, and uh, yeah, it's very, because it's related to survival uh, and it's related to in the moment adaptation. Uh, because you can only get from, a, in, let's say like, you know, you're at a job interview or, you know, or dating situation or meeting somebody for the first time or any situation that involves another human being, you know, you, ha- you have to take advantage of the time that they're there. Um, uh, sort of modern day expression for that is you have to be present. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And people will never tell you exactly what they're thinking. Part of it's not because they're liars. It's because part of it is part of it is none of your business. And the other aspect of it is that most people don't know what they're thinking all the time. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I mean, it's very normal when you, you know, when you get into a fight with somebody, it's like, I thought you said this and now you're changing your mind. And they're like, well, kind of, and you can sort of see that everyone's a little bit confused. Um, so, in a, you know, and so you can't rely on somebody. I don't mean you have to mistrust them. I just mean you can't make an assumption about what person, what a person is like, or what a person is saying, uh, because it will probably change in the course of the conversation several times. And Nunchi is a survival skill in that, you know, most people know from, I mean, like online dating is a perfect example of how people's first impressions or people, the, the foot that they put forward is extremely um, curated mm. and um, may be very different from the reality. And everyone tells you things to look for or red, red flags. Um, but some people are really, 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 really smart at this. Um, and Nunchi is a but Nunchi is a way of sort of figuring out when the person can't keep up the ruse anymore. Got uh, it. There's always a point. There's always a point with somebody who's let's say narcissist or hiding their true identity. Um, you can only do it for so long. If you're some people can do it for a long time. Uh, some people get away with it for years. But um, the vast majority of people, I, I liken it in the book to people, you know, when you are at a party or something and you suck your stomach in to look skinny or whatever. <laughs> um, everyone, can, everyone can do that. And, you know, and, and as an experiment, I was trying to see how long I could do it and hold a conversation. It's really hard to do it for more than even 60 seconds, right? You, and the point being that it's really hard to keep up a ruse for very long. And there's always going to be a point where somebody can't suck in their stomach anymore, metaphorically speaking. And Nunchi is a, is a way of pinpointing that moment mm -hmm. and not missing it. Uh, and that's why speed is important. And you also talk about it as a sort of a survival skill. Is it, yeah. do you think Koreans develop this hypersense, you know, and value the Nunchi so much because it was such a, there's such a rigid hierarchy and you kind of use Nunchi to sort of figure out where mm -hmm. you are within that hierarchy? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I talked to somebody, uh, Min Su Kang, or Kang Min Su, Min Su Kang, he's a professor of European intellectual history and he yeah. is a good friend of the Korea Society. He gave a great talk. Yes. Um, he, he translated a very famous, um, Korean folktale into English, uh, which mm -hmm. you should buy. I don't know if he's out there at all, uh, but I'll plug his book anyway. It's the, I think it's the story. I hope I get it. The story of Hong Gyu oh, the legend yes, of Hong Gyu Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, I asked him for the book, I interviewed him about what's, why, what's, what, why does Korea have Nunchi, why specifically Korea? And his theory was pretty much exactly what you're saying, which was, um, you know, traditional Korean society, um, is hierarchical, but not only that, there are hier hierarchies within the hierarchies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, you know, in Confucianism, you know, women are subordinate to men, but, you know, even among women, there's subordinate people within, you know, in a single household, right? Because the, the traditional um, house shape is, um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, um, sort of in the Arab world, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a square with a big courtyard in the middle. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, you know, um, Winterfell. <laughs> no, I mean, like, you know what I mean? It's, it's sort of a mini society where, and the whole point of the house design is that you, if you don't want to, you don't ever really have to leave the house. You can be outside right. in the sun, but still enclosed. So it's a very, I mean, it's not that you're not allowed. It's just that for safety or by choice, mm -hmm. everyone's kind of, not not ever really leaving this house unless they have to um and yeah there can be a lot of machinations uh and hierarchies and in order to survive you know you you know it was necessary to really pay attention and not annoy people and you know just sort of feel you know the the hair stand up in the back of your neck if somebody's angry um so i think that's a very good origin story but that is not to say that it's no longer necessary and that's not to say that it's only important in cultures that are similar to Korea, to Korean culture. Right, because I think some Koreans have very sort of a negative um, 
opinion of yeah. the world just being, because one of the, the bad things or it's one of the bad assessment you can give somebody is that all you yeah. have is nunchi. By that, all that, what they are doing is just trying to assess the situation and not doing anything. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I think what's really interesting with your book is that you're not saying that this is just about assessing. So there, when you have nunchi, then yeah. you can do something with it. Did I right. read that yes. correctly? Yeah. And you also, you know, hit something, hit on something that is very important, which is the sort of duality of nunchi. Um, you can criticize a kid for having no nunchi and you can criticize them for, you know, having too much, which sounds really weird, but um yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know if this is answering your question, but yeah, it is. Me. Yeah. So um, one of the first things I remember ever being sort of criticized about in my family was you have no nunchi. Mm -hmm. And I that other than the words for mother and father, that nunchi might have been the first Korean word that I learned. Um, you know, and it is extremely important for a kid and because it's like, you know, it, you, you don't tell your kid, you know, you're stupid or whatever. That's, you know, they're their kid. Of course they're stupid. But, you know, but the idea, if they don't have nunchi, that is really not okay. Mm. And, it, you know, there is no age at which having no nunchi is okay. Um, you know, because I know, like in the West, it depends on the culture, but generally speaking, people believe that children reach the, reach the age of accountability and reason at age seven. And in Korea it's three, um, you know, there's a Korean expression, um, a habit um, a habit built at age three glass till age 80, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're kind of fixed, or I mean, it sounds very kind of grim, but the idea is it is not too early to tell somebody um, to pay attention to those around them. And why is this harsh? You know, you would tell a kid, don't put your hand on the stove. You would not hesitate to tell your kid, don't run into street, even if they were three. You're not going to say, oh, but he's too young to understand. I'll wait till he's seven to tell him not to run into the street. No, you have to tell him, you know, now. And uh, it's the same thing with Nunchi. And, um, you know, it's considered like not maybe not more important than being smart, but none of it, none of the other stuff matters if you don't have it. Right. But, but then, yeah. Mm -hmm. But then what yeah. happens when you have too much Nunchi? Yeah, no, like you said, it's, um, you know, theory without practice is just sort of not, or, you know, analysis without, you know, any taking action is not really going to help you. Um, you know, it's a sort of cunning and uh, people don't trust you if they know that you're just assessing them, but not with any particular purpose. Right. Um, so, yeah. So then um, how do you tell somebody that they don't have too much nunchi without sounding like scolding somebody. Um, how do you tell uh, that very, I guess if you just yell at somebody that you don't have enough nunchi, then you yourself don't have you know, enough nunchi um, by doing yeah. that. Um, yeah. So how do you tactfully um, mm -hmm. with nunchi tell somebody that, yeah, you may need, as you said, because some, sometimes it's something that it's very hard to tell somebody because it's such a nebulous concept. It's not like you yeah. can quite pinpoint this is what you should do. Um, so how do you tell somebody? Well, I think that, well, first of all, it's never going to be easy to tell anything to, to, to give constructive advice or, you know, or not constructive advice, it doesn't matter how well-meaning it is. True. People are not going to appreciate it. But I think what's helpful about the word nunchi is, especially if somebody is not Korean, I think it's a really good way to criticize them. Because instead of saying, pay attention or read the room, which really does sound like you're belittling them, it's sort of like an objective you know, way of saying, okay, so there's this Korean concept called nunchi and it's considered very important. Um, and a good example is, you know, for example, instead of saying what you said, you could also say da 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 da, -da. otherwise it's sort of a lack of nunchi. And, you know, it's sort of a, it's a sort of roundabout way of, of telling the person that they need to fix something, but because it's a foreign word and because it's a really important and practical, pr 
practical concept, I think that people are more likely to digest it. Um, you know, just because it's it's the practicality, I think, that makes Nunchi different from whatever the synonym is in other countries and in other languages. It's purely pragmatic. Mm. And yeah. you actually um, go through certain steps where you can actually develop Nunchi. Um, if you, if this is something you're interested in having, um, can you just briefly, I, of course, I want everybody to read about it from your book, uh -huh. but can you tell us like just little tips of like, okay, like I've decided, or I realized that I, I should be a little bit more aware um, of what right. the, the situation, let's say, um, what can I do to sort of develop and sort of hone in that scale of Nunchi? Right. Um, so the book, I wrote it two years ago. Uh, there's a section called, called the eight rules of Nunchi, but to mm -hmm. be honest, I don't remember what they are. <laughs> but but, um, but the, the, one, the one thing that's sort of common to all of them mm -hmm. is, um, is an expression that is not a Korean expression. It's an expression by a Greek philosopher, Epictetus. He was a famous Stoic. He was the he and along with Marcus Aurelius are the, the founders of the Stoic movement. Um, and you know, so it's Nunchi and it's Greek and it's 2000 years ago, but they didn't call it that. Uh, but anyway, uh, Epictetus said, we are given two, two ears and one mouth that we may listen twice as much as we speak. You know, and we all, we all kind of know instinctively this is probably true, but it also just sort of feels like it feels like turning the other cheek or like, why should I give somebody else, you know, uh, a platform, you know, at one of my doormat, are they better than me? You know, why do I have to be the one to take the high road? But listening more than you speak isn't about taking the high road. It's more, it's, it's because it's because you gain information. Right. Because right? if you think about somebody who's a really good negotiator or tactician, there are obviously times when they talk a lot. But there are also a lot of times when they don't talk. Right. Right. And that's, you know, they're, you know, in their training, that's when people get nervous. That's when people sort of cave in. Um, you know, I mean, you see this on comedies all the time, but I've seen it in real life, too, where somebody's negotiating with their boss. You know, I've actually th this is a real situation. It happened to somebody I know, um, you know, he was going to ask for a raise. Um, but he didn't say that, you know, he just sort of said something, he was just sort of like, got, you know, it was a performance review. And so, you know, the, he just got there, you yeah. know, and normally you'd be nervous, but he was just like, Hey, what's up? Right. And, you know, wasn't saying anything. And the boss was expecting everything except that, except mm. that. <laughs> right. So the boss is, sort of, you know, after some faffing around and making some jokes about like, oh, do you like the new coffee? And, the, you know, the, the boss was like, OK, so you're probably wondering about whether your increased responsibilities come with a pay bump. I'm trying to keep it very vague to hide the identity. Right. 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 So you're probably wondering whether your increased response, because somebody left, the, somebody, the company left and he said, you're probably wondering whether it comes with a pay bump. And the other guy didn't say anything. And the boss became, even though the boss is you know, training as a manager should have told him, don't do this in the negotiation. Mm -hmm. In real life, if somebody's not talking, it is extremely nerve wracking. Right. right. So the boss is like, OK, well, here's the thing. Um, I know that we're paying you below, you know, you know, market value, which what? Why did he say that? <laughs> Nobody <laughs> asked him to say, you know, but if I give you a raise of X percent, you'd be making more than your manager. You know, how many there are like 10 pieces of information there. Right. Right. Which you know, the, the person I'm talking about did not, it's not me, it's really not, it's not like, a friend, it's really not me, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, and all the person did was just sort of sit there and quietly drink his coffee. Mm. You know, he didn't have to give him like a crazy stare. It was just sort of like, I wonder where you're going with this kind of, right. like, you know, right. and we all kind of, we all kind of know this, but nobody wants to do it because the idea of silence makes people completely freak out. Right, right, right. <laughs> it definitely does yeah. To me. yeah yeah like you know go to you know like if you're in a let's say you're in a conversation with somebody and you realize you forgot your phone 
Mm. You're like, oh my God, what am I going to do if there's a lull in the conversation? I have no idea what I'm going to do, you know? Um, but you can use that to people's advantage. Mm. Yeah. Right? You can have a huge nunchi advantage if you don't need to look at your phone. And if you can avoid, if you can deal with the silence without completely freaking out. Mm. So like, I would, anyway, this is a long way of saying the number one nunchi rule that the one ring that rules them all. <laughs> the one ring that rules them all is... Um, listen twice as much as you speak. Which is really kind of interesting because some people I think misunderstand Nunchi as, mm -hmm. um, or maybe it's just different way of using Nunchi, but some people just ask like, if you have too much Nunchi, does that mean you're being inauthentic? Um, which brings me to the question, because you talk about the difference between empathy and Nunchi yeah. Um, yeah. and how you really, you know, empathy is, you had a very strong um, opinion about how empathy does not necessarily mean it's a good thing when, when you're just being empathetic all the time, which I found it very interesting because, you know, we live in an age where we are supposed to empathize and sympathize with a lot of people. So what you're saying is that Nunchi is different from just purely having empathy. Actually, it's sort of the opposite. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I think that empathy, uh, I mean, obviously you have to have it or you're a sociopath, but it is severely overrated, severely overtaught. Mm. Um, and I don't mean, the, I don't mean the solution is to do the opposite. The problem with empathy is that it, it, you're basically trying to tell people there has to be an emotional component uh, to, with every interaction or else you won't understand what the person is saying. Right. You know, which is really offensive to all parties. It's like, I can't relate to that. I can't empathize, you know, or, you know, it, it, I don't have a, an emotional connection to this experience. So whatever, you know, so I can't help you. No, I mean, whereas Nunchi, it's a lot, it's like empathy in the sense that you want to know what's going on in the person's mind, mm. but it has the following differences. Nunchi is, it's not associated with female behavior, whereas empathy is considered a female trait. Um, so it's not cool for guys to have it and it's not for cool for women not to have it, you know, and whereas with Nunchi, there's no like sort of sexist element. It's just objectively a thing that you want. Um, another difference between Nunchi and empathy is that, um, empathy requires too much movement on your part. And when I say movement, I mean, like they can, if you think of the expression, I'm putting myself in your shoes, you know, why, how, why would you ever do that? You know, how is that going to help? You know, if I put myself in your shoes, that just means I would do exactly what you're doing. It's not understanding, you know, uh, and you disappear. Your identity disappears and you put yourself in a very vulnerable situation. Mm -hmm. If you think about stories about people, you, usually but not exclusively women who are in abusive relationships, 99 times out of 100, uh, you'll find that they're not stupid uh it's just that they were very they're really trying to see things from the other person's point of view they really <laughs> wanted to be empathetic he had a bad day um whatever bad childhood i was probably being really annoying um you know that's that's all coming from excess empathy uh and the sexism that goes with the word empathy uh, and Nunchi allows you to uh, try to understand a person but without completely losing your identity and disappearing into the other person's shoes. That's really interesting because a lot of people, I think, tend to think that Nunchi is about just figuring where you are. But I think you're mm -hmm. taking a very sort of a modern definition of Nunchi and saying that this is about actually knowing who you are and then figuring yeah. things out. So that's really, really interesting. So. A lot of people do mention, um, ask about the idea of how to use it when you are, because you talk about the, you know, walking into a room and that kind of mm -hmm. um, situation. Mm -hmm. We are certainly living through the time when walking into a room full of people is not happening that often. Yeah. Um, we are certainly doing things um, 
over the phone, over the Zoom yeah. call, just like we are doing right now. Mm-hmm. You mentioned actually Nunchi can be very、um, useful for things like online dating.、Right. So, how do you、mm-hmm. use your Nunchi when you are not physically in that room, but you are still somehow together with the other people? Oh, I mean, you know, for the last year and a half, I've been asked this a lot. Like,、mm. uh, how do you use Nunchi if people are wearing masks? How do you use Nunchi on Zoom?、Uh, And with no shade intended for the person asking the question, you're basically asking me if there's this, you know, if there's a silver lining to the, <laughs> you know, if, if, to the to the pandemic, or is there、right. something we could learn about this <laughs> deadly pandemic that's useful to developing our nunchi? I mean, there's nothing good about a Zoom meeting. There is nothing good about having to wear masks.、Um, I completely understand why you'd want to ask that, but I think the fact that there's no substitute for human interaction became really obvious. I mean, Zoom gives people migraines,、um, and there's this, there's a really, a, there's a Twitter feed that I really like. Called, I'm sure you've heard of it called、um, "Rate My Room."、Um, you know, and it's it's people taking screenshots of talks like this one、uh, and saying. You know, you have a cord violation. You know, like you sh- people shouldn't see your computer cords in the screen, or you need depth. You need a lamp. You know, I have flowers. That's very intentional.、Uh, and the fact that people are hyper focusing on stuff like that is like a cry for help. Or、you、maybe know, like, they just yeah. yeah maybe yeah. they just like nunchi. I mean, that's not the that's not the point, right?、Um, it's、yeah. about as you said, you can still listen、yeah. to people. You can still yeah.、Um, Yeah. You know, figure things out instead of just、right. focusing on what's you know in somebody's background.、Right. But then,、yeah. how do you how do you also、um, how do you sort of adjust to different way of communicating?、Um, I think you、mm-hmm. once also talked about, let's say, emails or social media. Like,、yeah. can you use your nunchi? Like,、uh, I mean, obviously, it's not immediate, but somebody just talked asked. The question about can you use Ninchi when you are、um, commenting on on social media or tweeting? Like you know, is is that something you can do?、Um, that at that point it becomes more just if for those who can't do Ninchi either because you don't know how, you're not emotionally equipped, or you're a small child. The substitute is good manners.、Mm. Right, and that's something that you don't need to see the person for, and you know, and that's something. I, it shouldn't be hard, but it seems to be really hard for people <laughs> to do it on social media.、Um, and I would, I would, I would, to answer the question about how to do it on social media, I would answer it the same as,、uh, um, how do you teach a child, nunchi, which is,、uh, well, you don't have to actually explain the concept because it might be abstract, but you can get teach them table manners. You know, you can teach them. You know, don't interrupt people when they're talking.、Uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be specific to any one culture. You just tell them whatever the, the manners are in your culture. Like, do you wait until people are seated before eating?、Uh, and the point of that is to show that there are rules, but they're not there to be stupid or to, for one party to have class dominance over another party. The rules. Exists because if everyone kind of adopts similar rules, it you know it's everyone just has a better time eating.、Um, you know the example that I there is a connection to social media, and I'll get to it in a second. The, the example that I give in the book is okay. Let's say you know there's always a joke like in Titanic. I don't know which fork to use, and there's an implication that you know you're just a jackass if you have lots of forks on the table. You know I mean there's a way to you know in some ways it's extreme, but let's say. Okay, like, let's say somebody's trying to tell you. Okay, so we're gonna have dinner with my my family.、Um, you know, I don't want to make you nervous, but I just want to remind you that the bread plate is on the left and the water glass is on the right. And somebody goes, "Oh, you know, oh, you're such a snob. I don't, you know, just don't even bother me with that." Okay, so what's gonna happen if they decide this is like snobby? Is you know they take the per- they take the bread plate at the right, and that's actually somebody else's bread plate. Right. And then they're like, they have no bread plate, or they have to steal some, you know. And just by refusing to follow rules because they're fascistic or whatever, you've unnecessarily made people really uncomfortable, and you know, slightly degraded the quality of the dinner. 
right? Mm -hmm. And I would say social media is the same thing as people think like, it's really redundant to be nice or say, great job, or, you know, why should I have to do that? Or, you know, uh, I like, you know, it's, it's just sort of, um, I think people know what they're doing. (laughs) I mean, you know, just be, uh, you don't have to have Munchie on Twitter. You just have to have good manners. Mm. Speaking of teaching children, um, there's a really um, nice story about you Mm -hmm. learning from your father about Mm Munchie. And it kind of struck me because he said, it's not the intention that matters. It's, you know, he basically said the harm is done, which is very different from how people may talk to their children because everybody says, you know, the intention is what matters. So can you tell us a little bit about what it was like for you? um, Because you were actually born in the States and grew up here until a certain time. And then you were all of a sudden uh, moved back to Korea um, and you had to go to school where you didn't necessarily Mm -hmm. speak the language very well. Obviously you were probably very familiar with it. so what it was like for you um, mm-hmm. to realize that, okay, this, there is something that I need to develop or I need to be more aware of. And how, and also the other question was, maybe it's, this is a separate question, but somebody was also asking about if you have social anxiety, um, how yeah. do you deal with the situations? Can you deploy your nunchi to sort okay. of, deal with that, the awkward situations, or, you know, if you're genuinely terrified to be with other people. Okay, I'm going to see, okay, uh, the first question was, the first, like, I think that's the, right. The first intention, about, the oh, intention, intention versus, yeah. Right, I think the part of my book that people find the most shocking, like, Tiger Mom said that the people that the, the, the people found the most shocking in Tiger Mom's book was the part where she told her daughter she couldn't, you know, have dinner if she didn't learn this piano piece. There's always one thing that people like latch on to. And the equivalent of that for my Nunshi book was people were like, that's child abuse. Why did your father tell you when you're a little kid that I, I would the situation was I had said something about my aunt or something like that, or I, I'd have right. accidentally offended my aunt and she told on me or so I, I, I'm not sure if this is, or no, it was a friend's parent. Sorry. It was a friend's parent, right. friend's mom. Um, and she told, you know, the friend's mom told my parents or whatever. And my dad was like, uh, you know, why did you do that? And I said, it was, I'm sorry, it was an accident. And my dad said, the thing, this is what horrifies people is he said, that doesn't make it better. The fact that it was an accident makes it worse, you know, which is actually, which is the opposite of most, what most parents would say. Um, what my father was trying to communicate was, you know, uh, something that we say now, which is um, intent is not impact. Hmm. You know, intention is all that matters is a nice idea, but it's, it's sort of also outdated if it's taken in and of itself. It's equally important to set, to teach people that intent is not impact. Um, you know, the real world consequences of offending someone are the same, whether you meant to do it or not. It's true. You know, and that's why Nunchi is important is that you can't mm-hmm. get away with just I didn't know that my jokes were offending people. I mean, how is that going <laughs> to No, Well, not only is it offensive to other people, but you know, you're, you know, people like that kind of tend to lose their jobs. And it was totally, it's usually totally avoidable in those situations. Um, the next question was about um, social, social anxiety and using your nunchi to sort of ease your anxiety about yeah. being, you know, yeah. Yeah, nunchi is a very practical tool if you have social anxiety. And this is why um, it, it has sort of tactile steps that involve you know, your physical body and the physical room. Uh, what I mean by that is like to give an example that I see a lot, you know, for, you know, um, uh, when, we're, when, when doctors are, or psychiatrists or psychologists are treating patients who have anxiety, um, whether they're children or adults, there's a list that's very popular and it's just an exercise you do in the moment. Um, like, um, and it goes like, this is not nunchu, this is, in the United States. And it goes like, okay, you're supposed to remember if you're having a panic attack or social anxiety, find five things that you can see, 
you know, name four things that you can hear, three things you can touch, two things you can smell. I don't remember the exact list, mm. um, but uh, the whole point of it is to physically connect with your surroundings instead of mentally being thrown off by your surroundings, right? I mean, it's important to be tactile and, you know, the physical, you know, we're most, we, every, we all, we all want to think that we're mostly mind and mind over matter. Um, but we're mostly body and the mind is like, you know, this big, uh, compared to the wisdom of the body. Um, and Nunchi is kind of like that mnemonic, you know, five things you can touch. You know, it's a way of saying when you go to a room, when you go into a room, instead of talking right away, I mean, say hi, you know, don't be a jerk. But after that, instead of talking right away, see what's going on, look around, you know, what do you notice? And you can literally name five things like this person is sloshing a drink around and maybe they've had a bit too much. The, the hostess looks really stressed out. You know, maybe I can see if I can help her. And then immediately with the moment you say, maybe I can see if I can help her. This is very gendered, I realize. <laughs> but like, you know, maybe I, can, maybe I can see if I can help him or her, or the host. Um, in the moment that you've decided to do that, you're, it, you suddenly aren't anxious anymore. Mm. You've identified something. And in this case, it's that somebody has a need. And then you can go help them. And you know, whenever helping somebody is, you know, is often said to be one of the best ways to deal with depression, anxiety, you know, like getting out of yourself, getting out of yourself is important. And you can do that by helping another person, you know, going to work for a charity, volunteering, or if you can't even do that, if you really can't even do that, you can at least connect. If you can't connect with people, connect with your surroundings. You know, there's, I see a table, I see post-it notes I see you know the the tissue that I used to blot my lipstick or whatever and um and that exercise is kind of like the table manager of a fork it seems really kind of stupid but rules exist because they work because it's a way of tricking our stupid brains their hyperactive brains to focus on something so in other words a way of dealing the way you can use nunchi of dealing with anxiety is the same as the way that professional medical professionals tell you to de deal with anxiety which is focus you know Tune out, I mean, not tune out. So don't say anything. Um, and to shut down the mind, you have to use your five senses and try to make yourself as much body as possible and as little mind as possible. Mm. And I think that's a great advice for everybody, whether you have social anxiety or not. Um, if, you, if it's okay, I kind of want to talk a little bit, not mm -hmm. about Nunchi, but... Yeah. You refer, your first nonfiction book, The Birth of Korean yeah. Cool, was published in 2014, um, mm -hmm. in which you talked about how this, the Korean wave, the Hallyu, is swept yeah. the world, is about to, or about to sweep the globe. And it talked about how, you know, all the workings behind the scene that right. um, brought the Korean culture to that moment. Obviously, a, a lot has happened since that moment, yeah. and it seems like it's more of a tsunami or rather than just a wave. Um, yeah. So, and as a journalist who are outside of Korea and witnessing, what has mm -hmm. it been like for you um, to witness sort of this, you know, now the Korea being one of the coolest places on earth, um, mm -hmm. but really having impact on culture not just in the united states but also in europe and south america mm -hmm. and you know the rest of asia obviously um what has it been like for you and what have you noticed what has changed since you wrote that book if there was any change sure i mean if i think about what is the being korean a diaspora korean in stages stage one was where's korea is that a real place Stage two was, oh, the Korean War. Stage three was, uh, well, I mean, let's fast forward, okay, to uh, Psy, okay? Because for a lot of people, those actually, it was like nothing and then Psy. Um, and to illustrate what's happened in the last decade or so with Korea, I like to tell the story about what happened when this book was being shopped around. I'm probably not supposed to talk about stuff like this, but um, so when this book was shaping, it was probably, 
when was it 2013? Yeah, 2013 was when I had, you know, uh, my, you know, my agent took me to different publishers. And, you know, said uni has this idea for a book about how Korea is, you know, is taking over the world with pop culture. And part of it is that the government had laid the, they're not like throwing money at singers that is not what i'm saying that is a huge misconception of my, my book is that they're throwing they're paying bts's salary you know yeah. no but you know they they did things like build super fast internet because they knew that a video was going to be the the trojan horse video is important um and what do you want to see on video you want to see songs but so before that so let's so 2012 psy comes out 2013 my book gets shopped around people are like well okay size a big thing but how do you connect the dots between Psy and claiming that this is a whole movement. You know, Hallyu, I've never heard the word Hallyu. Um, and one of the, one person who uh, the book was pitched to said, here's the thing about those billion hits on the Psy video. That was, um, what did he say? Oh, that was a million people in China being paid to click on, view a million times wait no sorry is that a trillion a thousand times a million people being paid to click a thousand times or maybe he said a thousand people being paid to click a million times and i was like wow he, he really does not want the korean wave to be a thing he really 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 is resisting this he what he will accept any sort of conspiracy theory other than you know that there was one gunman other than that people actually like korean stuff he was it, his mind recoiled at the idea you know, and I was like, why would you pick this song? I mean, I'm sorry. Like if they were, if, if the Koreans were going to invest money in hiring a click farm, they wouldn't have picked that song. You know, <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> there, there's no doubt in my mind that those billion hits were real. It might've been a thousand people clicking a million times, but that's because they really wanted to see it, you know? Um, so um, anyway, but then, yeah. And then, so now suddenly I get to do my, I was right dance. Um, you know, BTS is, they broke the Beatles, like several Beatles records. Um, they are a McDonald's Happy Meal, I think. I don't think yes. they have it here, but you know, what the hell? I mean, in my, you know, like it used to be when you get Star Wars figures, like you, you would have to be at the very top of the top, cult, the pop culture pyramid to be in a Happy Meal. Um, and, you know, you, you can walk into a CVS or Sephora and it, there's just a, a, like a big aisle that says K-Beauty and they don't make a big deal out of it. You know, it doesn't say like pearls from the Orient, you know, it's just like cute masks and things that smell like pomegranate or whatever. It's just it's just a big genre, um, you know, in everywhere, you know, here in France, too. Um, and um, yeah, so it's been really a wild ride. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy for Korea. I'm even happier for myself that I was right. And I can just sort of go, you know, well, I kind of, you know, you kind of, I told you this was going to happen. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, the, 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 the thesis of that is this book was sort of explaining the origins, like before BTS, you know, because this all started in the 90s. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I, if there's time for me to go into it so much, but basically, um, the reason that this happened in Korea, not in China, not in Japan, places that have more people, places that have more money, uh, why did it happen in Korea? Because they um, are very good at doing things as a country, meaning as a unit. Um, government cooperates well with private companies, maybe too well, some people would say. But, you know, it, they were able to say, OK, let's, you know, let's just dig up the whole country and put down Internet cable you know, let's just do it in like 10 months or whatever. You know, it's very hard for most countries to do that, especially if they're actually capitalist and not like, you know, command economies. Um, but they were very, very forward thinking. Uh, that's Nunchi, basically. There's a connection between the two books. Uh, you know, Koreans were, they were, Nunchi is paying attention to the market, paying attention to what's going on. Um, and they're like, okay, they're like in the 21st century, you know, you know, you know, other people can make machines and, you know, like, like you know, whatever. What, what do we know is always going to be popular, no matter how fancy technology gets. Movies and music. People are always going to want that. It's like a bar. You know, if there's no pandemic, people will always want to go to a bar. Uh, and, you know, no matter what other, even if there's like really sophisticated 
virtual reality amusement parks people always want movies and music and so they're like that's going to stay and you know what we're the advantage that we bring into it is is not the, that we have great music it's that we have fast internet mm -hmm. you know? um yeah go ahead and do you think since your book current mm -hmm. book both actually both books the birth of prinkle and the power of ninja has been translated to many different languages i'm sure you've mm -hmm. had chance to talk to people from all over the world so what this when we just talk about how you know popular bts is or how yeah. parasite won all these academy awards what we are yeah. really talking about is like is it really changing people's image or conception of korea um and obviously we're talking about south korea um but it, do you think that's happening or is it just something that people do do you think people are making that connection between oh is this place where all these interesting and cool things are coming or do they just take bts and they just take parasite and then that's that or is there some sort of a shift in terms of mm -hmm. how Korea, uh, how non-koreans view korea i think there's all of the above i mean i know people who wouldn't have paid attention to korea before and then they're now very interested in it as an economy as a language that's worth learning, um, you know, that's all that's very exciting. And then if there are, of course, people who just see, you know, just know K-pop and don't care about anything else and just, just think this is a cool genre or whatever, uh, and it's, it's disembodied from everything else. Um, I think it's all good. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, they're different, to answer your question, there are different levels of engagement or interest, you know, just like, you know, you might, uh, find something that could be a, like, you know, you might find like you have your first taste of croissant and then become a lifelong francophile and move there. Or you might just be like, oh, I like, I like pastries now, you know? I mean, and it's, it's all legitimate, you know? And I think it's the same thing with, with Korean cultures that there's a, there's a, um, a con, you know, continuum and, you know, there people are all over, all over it. Are you still interested in writing more about Korean culture or? Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it is just such a really interesting country. You know, it's like things are, everything's changed so quickly. And um, it's just so full of surprises, so full of contradictions. I mean, I think it's just, there's so many stories coming out of there that anything, everything just kind of writes itself. So, yeah. Yeah. And actually there was somebody who just wrote, um, who really liked your books and ask if you will be coming to the U.S. in the future to do book signings. Oh, well, there's <laughs> there's the bigger question, which is, um, I, I don't know, have book signings even started up again? Um, I don't think that. I think it's still pretty much virtual. Okay. Um, maybe this okay. fall, hopefully. I would be more than happy to do that as soon as it becomes possible again. I mean, that's I mean, that's definitely the funnest part about being an author is just sort of meeting people who actually want you to write your name in something that they bought. And, you know, I, I mean, that's that's actually my favorite part of it. So I'd, I'd love to do that. I don't have anything on the schedule. Uh, I haven't even had all my vaccines. I had my first one. Um, they were kind of they kind of messed up the role out here. But that's, that's enough, so, <laughs> you know, so but yeah, yeah. A short answer. Yes. Whenever I can. Yeah. Yeah, and on that note, um, that's all the time we have for now, but we hope you stay healthy and we Thank can't you. wait to see more from you. Um, and hope, hopefully one day we can meet again, not, in, not on Zoom screen, but in person and talk about all the wonderful things about Korea. So thank, thank you, you so much, Yuni, for joining us today. Thank you. Special thanks, thanks everybody. to Peter. Our I'm only director. I'm only assuming that there are other people there because I can't zoom and I can't see you. So I could be just speaking to nobody. But thank you, everybody who showed up. There are definitely people watching. <laughs> okay. All so, right. Special thanks to Peter, our IT director, for making you, this Peter. live webcast a possibility to our interns. Thank Gia you, Jay. And Che. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Uni. Thank you, and Gia of course. And um, thanks to you, our members and viewers. They are out there. Um, we hope you jo you'll join us again. Check out what's coming up on our website, koreasociety.org. 
or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you and have a Thank great you. afternoon. Thanks, Uni. Bye.